Hi guys, I wanna welcome you to uh, module number three. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed module one and two. And this is module number three, more questions, more answers. Uh, and this is to the practice test. A lot of these questions um, will be on the test. So you do wanna take notes, grab a pen and paper, and um, you know, make sure that you remember this stuff for the test if you're taking the test. Also guys, I wanna um, ask that you like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Um, I think I'm at 160 subscribers. I need to get to a thousand, literally, right? So I'm going to ask that you help me out. I'm helping you out with this test. I'm giving you the answers. So you got to help me out too um, by liking, sharing, and subscribing to my channel. And also, guys, remember this material is copywritten. I take a lot of time. I've been working on this presentation for probably the last Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday three days it's taken me to put this together. So I'm going to ask that you help me out by uh, liking, sharing, and subscribing to my channel and telling your friends about it. Um, and yes, I had a question. A gentleman asked if this information can be used in Indiana. The answer is yes. Um, the information that I'm giving you is not state specific. It's pretty much basic information. And guys, I think the cool thing is I've taken the test. I've taken the test here in Ohio and I've taken the test in Texas. And it's pretty much the same basic questions. You will have some state specific questions on regulations and state laws, but as far as property and casualties, pretty much the same. Uh, the basic stuff is probably from state to state, okay? So you can go over your state laws and your state regulations, and then you know go over this material. And I think combined, um, you should pass the test on the first try. OK, guys, I'm not going to try to keep you long today. I did add a few more slides because it looks like it's not taking me that long to go over the information. And then I like to start with the quote. I got this from brainyquote.com and it says health insurance should be uh, given for every citizen. And that was by Jesse Ventura, who was the governor, I think, of California at one time or another. OK, and I think uh, the governor of California, uh, Gavin Newsom, just gave all of the documented, the undocumented immigrants free health insurance, which is interesting. I was reading an article on that where um, they don't have to pay for health insurance. Um, if you're an illegal immigrant coming across the border, they said there are like 700,000 people in the state of California. They can now get free health care. And a lot of the residents of California are not liking that at all. And they're saying, oh, so we got to pay for our health care and their health care. And they're thinking that that's not fair. OK, um, I think we're on the cusp of something, uh, maybe universal health care for everybody in the country. And then the question is, hmm, who's going to pay for that? So, um, guys, let's keep abreast of the news and what's going on, because you never know when those questions or something similar may come up on the test. OK, so let's get right to it uh, with number one. Uh, who guarantees a surety bond? Um, the guarant the grant tour is the answer, not the insurer, not the guarantee, but they're going to try to trick you with the guarantee and the grant tour. Remember, it's the grant tour. OK, the grantor or the surety is the party that guarantees the contract will be fulfilled in its entirety to the guarantee. The grantor can require another party to join on its role as ensuring the contract is fulfilled if the grantor needs to lower the risk involved uh, with the account. OK, so just remember, there are two people there, the grantee, the grantor, grantor is equivalent to the surety, so know those uh, three words. Number two, the definition of actual cash value. You're gonna see actual cash value on the test, and they're also gonna call it what, ACV, so know that. Um, and what's the definition? Uh, actual cash value is the replacement cost, less depreciation. The replacement cost, less depreciate, depreciation. And some of you may remember that if you own property, but I think a lot of you guys are pretty young. Um, when I look at my demos, it looks like you guys are what, 25 to 35. I don't know if you own property. I used to own a property. And when you own a property, you can, on your taxes, a lot of times it was a rental property. 
I could minus depreciation. Every year your property has something called depreciation, whereas the value is not the same or, you know, some people's properties go up in, in value. Some people's properties go down. But on, in your taxes, you can, you know, minus the depreciation if your property gets older. So know that ACV, uh, they, they're calculating the replacement cost less depreciation. Many losses are reimbursed on the actual cash value or the ACV basis. Actual cash value is usually calculated by determining an item's replacement cost, subtracting, I said that, the amount of depreciation. Number three, surety bond. In a surety bond, who's responsible for actually doing the work, okay? So you got, I think, three people in that surety bond. Look it up, Google it. But on that surety bond, um, the person that's responsible for doing the work is going to be the principal, okay? Not the auditor, not the claims, not the underwriter, but the principal. Remember that. The principal is the party responsible in the surety bond contract for actually performing the work being done. Uh, the principal is performing this work for the obligee and guaranteeing the principal will perform the work to fulfill the contract, okay? Number four, what does personal injury mean, okay? Personal injury, um, and they, I guess they kind of trick you on that one because when you think personal injury, you might think, hmm, bodily injury, you might think, you know, I hurt myself, I got in a car wreck, personal injury, uh, liability comes into play, but personal injury, in insurance, it could mean uh, injury for such things as libel, slander, false arrest, or invasion of privacy, okay? Um, it's not just any form of injury. It's not a uh, bodily injury. It's going to be libel, slander, uh, something of that nature, okay? Some policies cover uninsured exposure for personal injury, which means liability for such things as slander, liable, false arrest, and invasion of privacy. In the insurance business, bodily injury and personal injury have two different meanings, okay? So when you go to sell auto insurance, um, there's bodily injury coverage, right? Um, so when you look at your state limits on liability, and I don't know what it is now in the state of Ohio, it might be 30, 60. In the state of Texas, it was probably a little bit higher than that. Um, so you got to know those things. What is those limits? Um, in the insurance business, bodily injury and personal injury are two different things. Um, and they are not used interchangeably. Okay. So if you're coming in to the industry, you need to know once you hear personal injury, that doesn't mean somebody got hurt with their body. That means somebody says something about me and I'm about to sue them. Okay. Um, the term bodily injury is limited to physical injury. Know the difference. Okay. Guys, number five which means of collecting data do insurers use to determine rates for premium? Um, the law of large numbers. We talked about that. I talk about it in the slides over the uh, definitions, and I talk about it in the probably module one on the content. But um, that's how insurance companies determine their rates for premiums. They're determined by the law of large numbers. You got actuaries. You've got a whole department that sits around and plays with numbers all day. And they figure, okay, well, this many people got in an accident, this many men, this many women, and they look at all those fun numbers and they figure out the premiums. And they call that the law of large numbers, not statistics and probabilities, not the possibility of theory, not the rate of probabilities, the law of large number. Concept, it believes that the larger the sample size, the more the average of data collected will be closer to the expected value. The law of large numbers is a means of collecting data to confirm the results expected is actual result from the true uh, sample of real exposure. Law of large numbers, guys, that's uh, insurance 101. You should know that. Number six, if you have two insurance policies from different companies on a property, what is this called? It's called concurrent coverage. Yeah, you can do that. You can have two policies. Uh, I've seen people with two auto policies. I think I've seen people with two homeowners. And what happens, I've had two health insurance policies at times. And what happens is you have a primary and a secondary and the insurance companies or the claims department will figure that part out, but not something you would have to worry about. Um, and then sometimes insurance companies don't like that. So you have to check with your company to see if that's okay. 
Um, sometimes insurance companies, if you have a concurrent policy, they want you to cancel one and just have one. So check with your management or when you go through training, ask you know people in training, can these people have two policies? Because it will come up, it may come up. Um, concurrent coverage refers to two policies that offer the same coverage against the same peril. Okay, concurrent causation is when two perils contribute to the same loss. Having concurrent coverage is not fraudulent. It's not fraudulent. You can do that, but some companies will allow it. Some companies might not. Okay, double indemnity is a division of life insurance policies that pays an extra benefit if death results from an accident rather than an illness, okay? So the company you're working with, this is a question for your management team, it's a question for your training personnel. Hey, what if somebody calls me and they already have a policy, can I sell them another policy? Can they have two policies? Ask the question, this is a good question. All right, number seven, when purchasing stocks, what means of risk is this? Speculative risk, right? I know a lot of young guys, Y'all are on Robinhood buying stocks, uh, Webull buying stocks. It's speculative risk, guys. Um, so know that insurance is what? Pure risk. Know the difference. You cannot gain from an insurance policy, uh, but you can gain from the stock market. Okay. Speculative risk is risk in which the insurer can either lose or gain from the risk. By purchasing stocks, the risk of losing money also runs the chance and also as well as gaining money. OK, so you buy a stock, you can win, you can lose or you can just sit there. Right. All right. Insurance, you lose. They try to get you back to where you were before. OK, which is tricky again, because I'm thinking FEMA and FEMA doesn't do that. They're not going to get you back to where you were before. They're going to get you, but they're not going to get you back. OK. All right. Let's go to number eight, guys. Uh, damages, uh, damage to a vehicle used as a prop in a production is covered under which policy? OK, so let's say we're doing what it will probably be a theatrical production. Right. So the coverage this is this is easy. Right. The, the coverage would be theatrical property coverage form. OK, because it'll probably be a movie or something. If you guys are out in California, you probably have this where people are on the set. I'm going to drive this car off a bridge. Why? Because I can. So you're going to have some type of coverage for that. OK, vehicles are covered if they are actually used on the set or the stage. Uh, in the covered production. Emission tickets are not covered. Property um, loss by theft from an unlocked, unattended vehicle is excluded. Okay. When purchasing a car, number nine, what type of risk are you taking? Pre risk. Okay. Car, you lose, um, got insurance, they'll try to get you back to where you were, uh, make you whole again. That's pure risk. Pure risk, by purchasing a car, you are taking on pure risk. A pure risk is a risk in which there is no chance of gain, just the chance of loss, okay? All right, guys, let's go to number 10. Uh, it says insurance is used to manage which type of risk? Again, pure risk, I went over that just a second ago. It's not excess risk, it's not assumed risk, it's not risk adverse, it's pure risk. That's easy. That's going to be on the test. You got to know that, guys. Pure risk by purchasing a car. I just read that. Let's go to the next one. 11. Solicitors may not what? Issue a countersign um, policy. Okay. A solicitor who often works with or for an agent may has more limited authority than the agent. A solicitor sells insurance and might even be authorized to collect premiums. However, a solicitor cannot issue or countersign a uh, policy. Know that. Um, I don't know if I saw that on the test, the test I've taken, uh, but you do want to make note um, when I did my research that did come up. So it may be something new, but I don't recall seeing that one. Okay. Hazards. Hazards are definitely on the test. Okay. Number 12, what type of hazard exists? when the insured has a bad attitude toward the care of her property because she knows the insured will pay. They call that a morale hazard. Remember, you got that's the one with the E, morale hazard, okay? Moral hazard, that's something different. 
Um, assumed hazards, speculative hazards, those are something different. A morale hazard exists when an insured no longer tries to protect his exposure to the uh, best of their ability because he or she is just relying on insurance to cover the loss. I would guess that would be like, let's say you go out drag racing one weekend and you're like, oh, I don't care if I wreck this really nice uh, $50,000 car because I have insurance. Mm, that's not cute. You should care. Okay, although the insurance company is going to pay for it if you wreck it, and then they may not pay if they find out you were drag racing. Just note that. But there are a lot of people that drive recklessly. Let's say on the freeway, for instance. Okay, I'm just going to drive and get in front of people and you know do my thing. But if you get an accident, I don't care because they're going to pay for it anyway. Okay, so that's kind of what they're talking about. People that do um, things when they know you know, in the back of their mind, I have insurance and they're just going to cover it. I'm going to leave this Rolls Royce on the side of the road. You know, I don't care why, because insurance is going to pay for that. All right. It says part of an insurance agreement is that the insured will act with reasonable care in protecting his exposure to the best of his or her ability. A moral hazard breaks this agreement and relies solely on the insurance company to pay for those losses. Okay, so you got to be careful. You need to know that. You need to know the difference between morale and morale um, with the L and with the E, because uh, those are two different things. And uh, those will probably be on the test. Okay, guys, again, um, I think I'm at 160 subscribers, but I've had 2,000 people watch my video, and I'm really happy. Thank you. But I know we can get it to 1,000. I know we can. So I'm going to ask again, very nice and politely, to please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And I'm going to ask you guys to check out my blog. I started a few weeks ago. It's called eddemnitynews.com. And I'm currently working on a book. I'm doing my research at this point. It's going to be on insurance, and I'm really excited about it. The more I research, the happier I get. I got two books in the mail today. Um, they're still in the Amazon packages over here. So, and these books are for research. Let me pause. I want to show you guys the books I got. I'm going to pause and get my books. Hold on. Okay, guys, I went and got my books. I got these in the mail today from Amazon. So I'm in the research phase of starting my book. I'm not going to tell you the title just yet because it's a surprise. Um, but I will show you the books I got in the, in the mail. I got this one. is Psych 101. So it's kind of be like a psychology book. And I haven't taken psychology since college, so I wanted to kind of brush up on my psychology. And the other book I got in the mail was this one, is Risk Management, uh, Principles of Risk Management and Insurance. And I just wanted to just kind of, again, like I'm doing with you guys with the test, brush up on my insurance. And when you're writing a book, um, you know, this is probably the one's first, second, third book I've written, but the other ones were like maybe what an ebook. I wrote on cannabis, and then I wrote some other books a few years back that were small books. But this is going to be my first really big book, serious book, and they advise that you do research. So I'm in the research stage, and then I got to get, what, three, four, five more books to research. So it's a lot of reading that goes into writing, which is kind of ironic. Um, who knew, right? So I'm going to do all my research first. And then they say you start writing because I was just going to start writing. But they say, no, you got to research first because you got to know what you're talking about. Right. So um, give me what another month or two and I should have the book done. And then I won't do any more. Um, what are these practice test videos for a while because I'm going to be working on the book. But once I get done writing the book, researching or if I decide to take a break from the book, I will do another practice test for y'all. Um, so I may be gone for another month or two, but note that I will be back. And the book will probably be on Amazon, hopefully, where you guys can have access to it. And um, I'll share that with you here. Was this January, February, March? Probably March or April I should have it done by. And um, I'm really excited about that. Okay. All right. So let's get back to it. Now, notice my commercial break. Number 13, when insurers, um, which insurer is an unincorporated group of members who share losses and provide insurance to each other? That's called a reciprocal exchange, guys. It's not a reinsurer. It's not Lloyd's of London. It's not a federation. It's a reciprocal exchange. 
And I'm thinking that should be on the task. That's something you should know. Write that one down. Reciprocal insurers consist of members who are unincorporated and collectively share losses and provide insurance to themselves. Okay, so they insure it to themselves. Lawyers of London is more of a syndicate, okay, of insurance. They're underwriters and uh, mutual and multi line insurers are example of traditional insurance companies. So note uh, what reciprocal insurers are. You should know that for the test, okay? All right, moral hazard. If you lie on a credit application for insurance, I left off an F there in my bad typo, for insurance application, what kind of hazard is this? That's a moral hazard, okay? So that's the moral without the E, okay? So the one without the E is for people who lie on their application. The one with the E is for people that don't take care of their property, okay? So write those two down. If you got note cards, I don't know how you're studying, you got a notebook, one with the E, one without the E. Know the difference in those two, because they'll trick you. They're gonna word it. And a lot of the test questions are backwards. And I used to read them backwards for that reason. <laughs> a lot of them are backwards, so you gotta read them backwards and they try to trick you. So know that a lot of times it's a trick question, right? Moral hazard is lying about your credit history or other in order to benefit from obtaining an insurance contract. An insurance contract requires all parties to enter in good faith. And therefore the contract may be voided if the carrier um, from the carrier, if they find out that you lied on the application. So let's say uh, Joe Blow has an auto claim, but he lied on his application because they do what they do. Guys, they have a fraud department insurance too, a whole big old fraud department. And when you call for claims, a lot of times you don't just get the, they might pay you out on the claim, depends on how much it is or what happened. But if they suspect that there's fraud, they'll send investigators out. And if the investigators find that, oh, you lied on the application, they might not cover it, you know? So note that, um, you know, you're talking to people, you're signing, they're signing up, you're doing the application. You do have to stress honesty and that, you know, are you sure? You know, because um, I had people call and, you know, I can tell that mm, you're not really your dad, you're you, you know? So just try to stress that, you know, that this is an application, it's a legal document and you must tell the truth, okay? Uh, number 15, covered costs under a liability policy aside from the costs paid for any injuries or damages are supplemental costs, okay? So know that guys that, um, it's not ancillary costs, it's not consequential costs, it's not cost benefit analysis, it's supplemental costs. Supplemental costs are paid to the insured in addition to the policy's liability limits. Examples include paying for an attorney and lost earnings uh, for appearing in court. The other options, A, C, and D, are terms not associated with uh, liability policies. Okay, got it. Number 16, guys. Uh, below is everything on the uh, declarations page except uh, what? Policy exclusions. Now, I did see a video online where the girl was going over the declarations page, and I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I should do that one day. I don't know. Put some comments in below. Let me know what you want me to talk about. If you want me to talk about the deck page, I will. Um, but I don't know that the deck page is all that. You know, the, what's on there? The insurer's name, address, limits on liability, the date. And I think that's a quick one is the date on the, on the policy. When you write um, an application, when you hand somebody a policy, a binder, you want to make sure that the date is correct on the application or the policy. Because I've done policies where the date was not correct for whatever reason the computer could have generated it i might have made a mistake but if the policy starts tomorrow at midnight or tonight at midnight check the application check the policy before you send it to the customer and make sure that the date says today's date 12 o'clock till 12 o'clock a year from now or from whenever that policy expires okay because i've seen the typos on that and it's not cute uh policy exclusions the declarations page contains the name of the insured, policy limits, um, premises being covered, your house or your car, 
um, and the policy period. That's the date. The exclusions pertaining to the policy are not on the declarations page, um, but rather in their own section of the policy. Okay, guys, let's hit number 17. Um, I think we're nearing the end. Um, something that might increase the likelihood that a loss will occur is called a peril. You should know that. We've gone over that a few times. Um, it's not a risk. It's not a hazard. It's not a, cat a catastrophe. It's a peril. Okay. Um, a catastrophe causes sudden damage. Uh, peril is a cause of loss. Risk is an uncertainty arising from the possibility of the possible occurrence of given events that would result in a loss with no opportunity for gain. Number 18, hazards. You do need to know hazards. I didn't make notes on this one for some strange reason, but know that the hazards the insured is protected against is in which section of the policy? It's in the section of the uh, insuring agreement. So you're going to get there. They're going to train you. And then you're going to, you're not going to sell anything right away. It's going to take some time, but you are going to sell something. And when you do, um, make sure that you go over the application twice, go over it once with your client, go over it once on your own, slowly, uh, typos, check your spelling, um, then if you do issue a policy, if you issue a binder, if you, you know, send out uh, confirmations, make sure that the dates are right, the times are stamped right, the address is correct. Always double check an address. Always double check the name. This is a, a this is going to be a good one, guys. I'm going to give it to you, right? Um, the name on the driver's license when you're doing an auto application has to be the name on the policy, okay? Um, people will call you and they'll say, you'll say, hey, what's your name, Bob? That's not the name on his driver's license. The name on his driver's license is Robert, okay? Um, you'll get it a lot. You'll get uh, Mary Jo Baker, she'll call. What's your name, Mary? That's not the name on her driver's license. The name on her driver's license is Lucy, Lucy Mary. Her first name is Lucy, her middle name is Mary, okay? So here's the clue, always ask, what is the name on your registered driver's license? Do you have a <laughs> Do you have a current driver's license? Is your is your driver's license not expired? Ask those questions because I'm gonna tell you a secret. It's gonna cut out a whole lot of pain and misery because you're gonna do the whole thing and you're gonna find out their license is expired. Are you gonna do the whole thing and you're gonna find out the name on the policy that you put that you typed in is not their name on the driver's license? OK, you're going to learn that in training, but in the real world, yeah, ask, is this the name on your, take the name, Bob John. OK, um, Bob, is that the name? How does your name appear on your driver's license, sir? Is that the same? Mary, how does it appear on your, no, on my, oh, no, on my driver's license, this is Joe, is, is Joe, is Mary Joe, you know, is not going to match. So you got to run reports. You got to check that information, dates of birth. I've had people who would call and give me the date of birth of their father. Okay. How old are you? I'm 49. Why'd you just give me a, a date of birth for somebody who was 58? You know, double check those things. And you're, here's the thing. You're going to be so excited. You sold something. You're going to be so excited. They want to buy something. And you're just going to breeze over all of that. Don't get in the habit of planting your flowers. That's what I, we call it in sales. Make sure your garden is perfect. Make sure everything is in place because ap my applications were long. They were long and they were arduous. And if you made a mistake, guess what? You had to go back over and start it all over again. There wasn't a whole lot of, I can go back and change this, okay? When you're doing an auto policy, okay, who's the primary driver? Is it you or your husband? Don't start the policy in her name when she wants it in her husband's name. You can do that. A wife can do a policy for a husband. A husband can do a policy in his wife's name. Make sure you know those things before you start the application. Okay. That was your piece of advice for watching the video and subscribing and liking and sharing. Okay. So I gave you that. Give me something back. Okay. Number 19, a device that is used to minimize small claims and lower premiums is called a deductible. Okay. So, um, 
again, you guys are pretty young. I don't know if you're paying deductibles on your own, but know that the deductible is the price that they pay when something happens. They pay that before the insurance company will pay out. Okay. Deductible transfer of risk is transferring the risk to another party, such as an insurance company. Co-insurance requires you to carry coverage for a certain percentage of your property's value. Arbitration is when an independent third party settles a claim or dispute. No, deductible. Now, people are really weird with their deductibles. I'm going to give y'all something else, okay? Um, this, is, this one is a good one. But people are weird with their deductibles, okay? Especially on auto, home too. But on auto, what I've experienced is uh, most people, they have the psych, that's where I'm reading the psychology book. They have this psych thing where they want their deductibles at $500. Oh, where do you want your deductible? $500. That's on the auto policy. Okay. Um, I think if you're driving a Tesla, it has to be a 2000. I'm not sure it was with my company. It may be different with your company, but you want to check that. Um, personally, I like my deductibles at 2000. Why? Because what? Know the answer? No? Okay, I'm going to tell you. The higher your deductible, the lower the premium. That's something you're going to find out really quickly as you play with the numbers. So you don't want to fight. It depends. But I never wanted to give somebody a $500 deductible. Why? Because then their premium is going to be high. And our, and our insurance was high. I, I didn't work for a company. I didn't work for Geico. I didn't work for Lemonade. I worked for a, a highfalutin company, a multi-billion dollar company, and it was expensive. So if you chose a $500 deductible, that meant your premium was going to be high, especially if you had bad credit, right? So you want, for me, okay, I tried to push it. I would push it to $750. I would push it to $1,000. Why? Because that means the premium was going to be lower. Then I would ask the customer, how comfortable, they asked for $500. I would say, how comfortable are you moving it to $750? If they move it to $750, that's going to lower the deductible, that's going to lower the premium, and they're more likely to buy. Okay. If you move it to a thousand, I'm going to lower the premium some more and they're more likely to buy. If you move it up to 2000, it's going to lower it some more and they're more likely to buy. Note that some people, they just want a low premium. They don't care about deductible. Some people, they're all about the deductible on a home. It's the exact same thing. You got people on a home. They want it at 1%. 1% is going to get you a higher premium. 2%. Hmm. I usually put them at 2%. I would put my deductibles on home at 2% and I would ask no questions. Why? Because that was going to give me the lower premium. You move it to 1%, their premium is going to spike. Same thing. If I take it to 4 or 5, boom, premium comes down. Most people, mm, they don't like 4 or 5. But I have had customers that ask for 4 or 5. Okay? So it depends on the customer. It depends. So talk to them. Get to know them, do a little rapport, find out how they feel in, you know, they're a little risky. You might ask, you might not ask, but note those things. Okay, I gave you another one. I need a like, share, and subscribe. Thank you very much. Number 20, we're almost done. If property is replaced by an insured at the same or equal value in the event of a loss is what type of loss valuation? That would be replacement cost, okay? Not ACV, not bra form, not standard form, none of that other stuff. It's going to be replacement cost, okay? Replacement cost valuation requires an insurance company to replace property with the same or equal value in the event of a loss. This is ideal for the insured as opposed to actual cash value, which subtracts depreciation from the replacement cost value. We talked about that. Which homeowner's policy is designed for owner-occupied dwellings? It's the HO4, guys. HO4 policies are designed for those uh, renting a dwelling, HO3, HO5, HO8. Uh, policy forms are intended for owner-occupied dwellings. Okay, um, did I say that right? Which homeowner's policy is designed for owner-occupied dwellings? Um, that's a little confusing. 
Okay, so yeah, that's a little confusing. So look those up. I did go over those in the lesson. I went over all the HOs, so know all the HOs. Those will be on the test, and that part is not fun. Um, so before I walked in, I would have to go over those again, and you have to do your own little tricks to remember those because those are complicated, all right? Guys, number 22, unauthorized um, uh, instruction. What is it? Unauthorized instructions inventory storage and employee dishonesty are examples of what are examples of theft exclusions under which form the special form okay special form inventory storage unauthorized instruction and employee dishonesty are examples of theft exclusions under policies containing the special form cause of loss some other theft exclusions include unexplained disappearance building material theft and voluntary parting, okay? Another name for comp uh, compensatory damages is actual damages. Know that. Um, don't know if this is gonna be on the test very much, but you still wanna know that. In my research, I found this one. Um, compensatory or actual damages reimburse a party for a loss sustained in order to make the party whole again, okay? Punitive damages are damages exceeding simple compensation and serve to punish the defendant. General damages are damages which exceed simple compensation and awarded uh, to punish the defendant. Broad damages are not particular type of legal damage, okay? No uh, punitive damages and um, what was the other one? Comp compensatory damage. Know the difference between those two. They might be on the test. Um, number 24, we got maybe a couple more slides left here, guys. We're almost done. Uh, coverage for the dwelling, personal property, and other structures on all risk basis is what type of homeowner's policy? That's an HO5. Okay, go back over those. I don't know which uh, module it was in, but I know I did talk about those. Uh, the HO5 uh, comprehensive Form provides coverage for the dwelling, personal property, and other structures on all risk bases. The HO5 is the broadest homeowner's form available for homeowner, uh, home, what do we say, owner-occupied dwellings, okay? Number 25, guys, which is an injury that qualifies as a compensable injury under workers' compensation? Com I, mean, I think it means... Uh, compensable means you can get paid for it. What kind of injury, if you got injured, let's say workers comp is what on the job. So what kind of injury could I get on the job and get paid for that injury? It would be who would get paid? It would be a hotel worker. Let's say if a hotel worker, not just hotel, but any job, if someone at work breaks their leg while they're at work, yeah, I can get compensated for that injury. So again, that could be a teacher, it could be a manager, it could be a bus driver, but with the other ones, they're not at work, okay? If you're at home, no, it doesn't count. If you're on your way to work, it doesn't count. If you come away from work, it doesn't count. But if I'm at, I'm a hotel worker, I'm a teacher, I'm at work, boom, I slip and fall, boom, I get paid for that, okay? Uh, Work-related injuries must arise out of employment and arise in the course of employment to be co compensable, okay, to get paid for it. Time and place, circumstances are considered in making that determination, okay? Guys, number 26, uh, we're going to talk about FEMA a little bit. Uh, FEMA handles natural disasters, what hurricanes, flooding, um, tornado, they come in the federal government and they manage those disasters or those catastrophes. Most insurance companies do not handle large uh natural disasters. Although the company I did work for, they did flood insurance, but the flood insurance was backed by FEMA, the federal government. It was not backed by the company that I worked for. So know the difference. Uh, which government funded program helps to protect against losses caused by flooding and aid and recovery from natural disasters such as hurricanes? I just said that, right? Uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Guys, I want you to look at FEMA. I want you to go on their website. It's FEMA.gov, G-O-V. Get familiar with FEMA because um, I'm going to tell you what they're going to ask you. The customer's going to call. They're going to ask you this. Do you cover flooding? What do you mean by flooding? You know, um, I'm a smart ass. I get it. But 
what do you mean by flooding? Are you talking about your dishwasher flooding in your kitchen? I had that happen to me here a couple of weeks ago. I was going in the kitchen, and there's water under the dishwasher. Is that what you're talking about? Or are, do you live on the coast? Are you in California? Right now it's about the flood all on the East Coast, all up South Carolina, Florida, from Tampa on up to New York. Are you talking about on the coast? Are you talking about in Dallas? Sometimes you'll have what they call flash flooding where I could be driving my car, boom, the sewers back up and my car starts to float off into space. When they say flood, it's very important to know what is their definition of flood because there are lots of definitions of flood. I just gave you most of them, okay? No, insurance companies do not cover flooding. However, if you have a homeowner's policy and your dishwasher floods in your kitchen, yeah, they'll, they, they might cover that. If you have a pipe burst in your wall from pressure or something going on in your house, they might cover that, right? But you cannot sit there and tell somebody, yeah, they'll cover that. No, I'll send you over to the claims department. I don't know. I do not answer claims questions. That's my advice to you. Why? Because the call is being recorded and because you're not a claims representative. You are an insurance agent. You sell insurance. You don't do claims. They're going to ask you what's covered. Uh, go over the basics, this, that, that, that. Boom. What if I don't answer what if questions? What if the dog died, the cat ate him, and the snow jumped off the roof? I can't answer those questions. I just can't. I guess you're over the claims. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. You don't want that customer. Why? Because they're going to cancel the policy anyway. They probably won't pay the bill, whatever, but you don't want them. OK, you want people to understand insurance. You want people that are going to pay the bill. And in six months, you're not calling them saying, hey, bruh, can you pay the bill? Because you're not you haven't paid it. That's going to be your job, too, by the way. OK, so if somebody calls you and they're asking a lot of crazy questions, most times you don't want them as a customer. No, I don't. I, I don't know. Let me get you over to claims. Go, go to the next one. OK, because th there are too many easy fish to catch. So don't work. Don't try to catch the fish that are fighting to get off the hook. Just don't waste your time. And then it'll be a thing where they'll ask one question and then they'll ask another. I've had people on the phone for hours. I mean, I've had people that hung up on me and call back a day later and say, OK, I'll take the insurance. But you're going to get a lot of crazy calls. OK. And again, guys, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, put them in the thing and I'll answer your questions even after you start working. If you have a question, DM me, email me. Carmen, what should I do? How do you handle this? What was what? I will answer your questions, okay? But people will call you and they're going to ask a lot of crazy questions, okay? Just try to know which answer you need for which question. And then what I did toward the end is I would take the whole entire application and I would type it out in a Word document. And I would just write the questions. What is your name? Is that the name that appears on your driver's license? OK, why? Because I ask the same question all day, every day. I'm asking everybody the same questions. The questions don't veer. OK, and then it keeps you on track and then you don't miss something or you don't forget to ask something. You know, it's kind of like when you're flying a plane. I've never flown a plane before. Right. But let's say I was flying a plane. When they get into a plane, they have pilots have a checklist and they have to check off everything on that list and then they can fly the plane. Right. You're, you're, think of yourself, when you get in there, you get your headphones on, you're sitting down, you're a pilot, you're flying the plane, check off, this is the, my application, what's your name, is that the name as it appears on your driver's license, what's your date of birth, know their date of birth, uh, is this going to be for you, is it going to be for your husband, are you married, are you single, do you have kids, who lives in the house, you're going to ask the exact same, it's a lot of questions, guys, and you're going to ask the same questions over and over and over again, type them out, Put it on your thing, have it in a Word doc, pull it up, ask your questions. You can move faster. You can get more business done if you have those questions written down. But if you're sitting there and you don't know what the next question is and you're flustered and they're asking you all these dumb questions, don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to yourself. Okay. All right.
last one, FEMA, Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency is a government funded agency started back in 1979 to help prevent or respond to and aid in the recovery of what? Natural disasters. FEMA not only will support citizens affected by natural disasters, but also uh, they help to first for, to aid uh, first responders in efforts to respond to uh, natural disasters. OK, so guys, note that and we're done. I gave you a couple of three gems in there. So I know y'all going to hook me up on the like and subscribe. So, OK, also check out my blog, Identity News dot com tiktok identity uh follow me on tiktok and pinterest i need some followers on pinterest as well guys it's been real i will see you again soon hopefully uh i have my book done by then and i'll be it'll be up on amazon talk soon